Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, my name is Keith Kirkland. I'll describe myself as a haptic enthusiast. And initially, I titled this talk, The Next Frontier in Education. And we're going to get there, but I feel I needed to go back a little bit just for the people in the room who might not have a prior understanding of this world of haptics. I'm going to tell a lot of the story through my own personal story, but the greater narrative that I want you to look at while I'm sharing this is that, like, this is one example of what we believe is going to be a haptic revolution. Um, and, and the same way in the explosion that's happening in the AI, I mean, in gaming right now um, we have, that we've heard about, um, we think that the sense of touch is, is, is prime for a similar type of explosion. So I just want to set a framing for how I got into this space and like, where I think is going uh, next. Can I get the next slide, please? So this is Simon Weeproff. He's an ultra marathon runner based out of the UK. And he happens to be legally blind through a condition called retinitis pigmentosa. Now, Sun reached out to us. Um, he wanted to see if we could fulfill his dream of being able to run in the New York City Marathon without needing a sighted running guide. Now, if you're unfamiliar with how people who are blind and visually impaired run marathons now, oftentimes they're tied physically to a sighted runner. Um, sometimes they run shoulder to shoulder. Oftentimes it's a physical tether around the fingers. And oftentimes athletes with their sighted running guys will train to run in lockstep, almost kind of like a three-armed race. Um, and that's how you get the cues to, to run it. And Simon wanted to be able to run completely independently. Um, he saw an article that we had that had dropped in TechCrunch or in Gadget and reached out to us to see if we could help support him. Um, let's see. Let's see if I can control this. Sorry about that. Can I get the next slide, please? Perfect, sorry. It looks like I can't control it from here. My apologies. Um, awkwardly, I have to change slides as I need them. Um, but now, in 2017, in November, just eight months after our initial call, Simon Weeprop becomes the first person who's blind to run in the New York City Marathon without needing a sighted running guide. And he did that using our very first product. Now, in the photo here, you'll see as a visual description, it's black and white. You'll see Simon kind of second to the left, running um, with his sighted running guys, running around him all the way to the far right. You see my co-founder with his hands in the air, ran the marathon with them. You know, we deliver great customer support. So after the marathon, Simon crosses the finish line and we make history, right? And one of the things that we realized in that making is, is one, that for not that much money and not that much development effort, we were able to do something that no one had done before. But also to what we realized is, is that the possibilities that could exist because we were able to do this just open themselves up dramatically. Next slide, please. So how did he do it? Wayband. Now, Wayband is a haptic navigation device. It's a wristband that gently guides you to your end destination using only vibration without the need for any visual or audio feedback. Essentially, we took the map and put it into your skin so you can navigate while keeping your eyes and ears free. Next slide, please. Now, so before we jump into haptics, let's talk a step back, right? You know, what is haptic? Now, really simply put, haptic just means touch. I like to say like optic is for eyes, haptic is for skin, right? And 
what we are looking at and what we do is we are looking at ways of using the skin as a communications channel to deliver information in a more intuitive way. Now, haptic means a lot of things, right? You know, for the people who might have some deep expertise in the space, we're based in vibrotactile. That means we're using vibration and vibration-based driven motors to stimulate, you know, the sense of skin at a surface area point. Now, you have opportunities from the haptic sense to explore temperature, which is its own subset. Um, pain and itch even have their own channels, which, you know, need deep exploration as well. And so when you look at also to a big part of the haptic sense is your, 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 your internal awareness and the sense of your video, um, the sense of where your body is in space. Right. You know, and so like, how do you know where your hand is when you lose sight of it? Like that's also your internal sense of haptics. Right. And so haptics is a very, very broad field. Um, you know, right now, what most people are talking about when they're talking about haptics, they either talking about viral tactile or talking about surface interaction. Haptics, right. Um, and that's the space that we're playing in right now is the viral tactile haptic space. Next slide, please. So here's the thing. And, you know, and it, it, it was a postulation, a, a, a post, a, a, sorry, a postulate of mine. Um, I wanted to see, you know, from the point of view of the skin, you know, like we have, you know, I can read visual words, I can listen to auditory sounds. Is there a way to understand language through the, the sense of touch? And this is kind of how... I walked into this door, you know, and I think that every haptician's kind of holy grail was this idea of, you know, building some kind of like language that some kind of went around and, you know, was underneath the need to communicate on a verbal point of view, right? And I think that through all of my time here in my research, I don't think that that's the space, or at least not right now, we're not there. But one of the things I think is, is that largely where we are and I'm, I'm talking about from the point of view there are some specialized applications out there and lots of people doing research in the space that is pretty awesome right but i think that like from the point of view of the understanding from the mass population of what haptic means and what haptics are mass population understands haptics from a point of view of notifications and the conversation that we've been having for the last nine years is think of haptic as communication as a way of giving information directly through the skin that usually would have to be delivered through the ears and eyes, ideally freeing those modalities to focus on what they do best and not trying to put everything into a heads up display. Next slide, please. So this is a little video. Um, when you click on this video, it should launch from um, the, the PDF. Um, and this video, I'll, I'll give a, a, a slight intro. Um, we built an entire. Oh, perfect. Can you, can you show up that back from the very beginning? That's awesome. Um, a new way to navigate. One that gets you out of your phone, back into the real world. We are Wearworks, a haptic design company. We build products and experiences that communicate information through touch. Navigation is inherently visual. This means you have to constantly juggle your attention between looking at your phone and seeing what is in front of you. And for the 21 million of us living with a visual impairment, it's even more profound. Navigation takes away the ability to hear what is going on around you, and that is how you keep yourself safe. Introducing Wayband, a wrist-wearable haptic navigation device that delivers turn-by-turn -turn navigation directly to the skin. What this means for you is an intuitive navigation experience that frees your ears and eyes so you can be fully immersed in what's going on around you. At the core of Wayband is our patented haptic corridor. We've built a 360 degree touch based compass that gives you vibrational feedback based on the direction that you are facing. When you are going the correct way, you feel no feedback. When you turn away from the correct path, you get a slight vibration, and that vibration gets stronger the wronger you are. We've tested with thousands of people, and 90% can figure out the correct way to go within 10 seconds. It's that simple. We began five years ago with a question. How can we use touch to deliver information in a more intuitive and less obtrusive way? We began our exploration with navigation. 
Then in March of 2017, we were approached with the ultimate challenge. Simon Wheatcroft is an athlete who is blind. He dreamed of running solo in the largest marathon in the world. And on November 5th, just eight months after our initial call, Simon, guided by Wayband, went down in history as the first person who is blind to run the New York City Marathon without sighted assistance. We talked to hundreds of people about their challenges with visual-based navigation. Across the board, it was the same. They wanted to get out of the device and back into their lives. It's easy. Setup is simple. Open the Wayband app and turn on the Wayband device to connect. After that, you input the address, confirm, and put your phone away. Touch is personal. So we built the ability to adjust the feedback level based on your comfort. Researchers and developers use the API to connect Wayband as a peripheral device to explore and create custom haptic experiences, games, and applications. Wayband gives you the confidence and the freedom to explore your world without a screen in your way. Go anywhere with Wayband. So um, that's what we've been doing. Uh, for the last bit of time. Um, and that is the work that ultimately led Simon Leecroft to come and seek us out. It was never our goal initially. Um, and I think that like, you know, one of the opportunities that really shows up in the space that we've been really excited about is, is the more open that we've been to kind of listening and, and like engaging with the community that we're developing, um, the better and the more interesting opportunities have come in for us to actually like engage and do these amazing projects together. So really want to thank the team on that part of it. Um, next slide, please. So who am I? I should introduce myself. My name is Keith. Um, I call myself a haptic enthusiast, but uh, you know, um, a little bit about myself, my background. So um, I have a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering a bachelor's degree in fashion accessories design, essentially handbag shoe design. And I have a master's degree in industrial design. Um, my pathway was quite a bit twisted. Ultimately, I started with mechanical engineering because I thought I wanted to be maker of cars. Realized that um, I didn't really like engineering that much after six months of working. Decided that I was gonna put all the artistic talent I cultivated all of my life drawing comic books to good use and go into fashion, um, really fell in love with handbag and shoe design, um, went to FIT, the Fashion Institute of Technology, um, graduated, worked in the industry uh, for a few years, um, did some time at Calvin Klein, the sports second coach. And then ultimately, um, I decided to leave the fashion industry and go back to school. Um, I wanted to see if there was uh, other opportunities to use design to essentially impact and help, you know, humanity progress forward. Um, under that exploration, I went and got a master's degree in industrial design from Pride Institute in Brooklyn. When we got there, they invented this program called Global Innovation Design, and we got to be the guinea pigs. And so seven of us volunteered. Um, so I spent six months studying at Cale Media School, at Cale University, um, their media design program. And then I spent another four months studying innovative design engineering at the Imperial College and Royal College's arts joint program in London. I came back and ultimately I missed fashion so much. I was like, wow, I really want to go back into this. Um, how can I hit this in an angle that makes sense for me? And ultimately I kicked in around wearable technology. Um, now, long story short, you know, I ended up doing a thesis in the wearable technology space. Um, and I got really interested in movement and movement learning in particular, why I'd always been interested. And so I realized that this was a way to tag in my personal love. I studied martial arts since I was like a teenager, varying formats, ninjutsu, kido, capoeira, um, and also to uh, Kung Fu currently. And I also like, took up skateboarding on my 33rd birthday. I also had all these injuries related to these movements. And so I was exploring how can I learn movement in a safer way? And that's how I got into the haptic space was essentially, um, I was trying to build a suit that would allow a person to download Kung Fu and this would teach them using vibration. Ultimately, I just saw the matrix way too many times. Next slide, please. 
So at Wear Works, what do we do? We don't make Kung Fu downloading suits. We make haptic experiences and we license our haptics, SDKs and APIs. Now, um, all that technical jargon is simply to say that we specialize in, when we approach a problem from a point of view design, you know, we approach it from a point of view of like, how can haptic from as a primary experience enable or exceed the current standard or the current art that's in the space that's available. Um, and one of the amazing things about touch is, 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 is purely it's, it's, it's its accessibility is that more people have access to it. Right. And so this ultimately from a touch point of view first, ultimately builds accessibility into the narrative from the very beginning. Um, and our goal is just to create these experiences to enable others to be able to tag into them, you know, ultimately really easily, but first being the model and showing the tools ourselves what we can do with them. Next slide, please. So in our personal journey, right, and again, this is, we're going to talk about navigation as the, the choice that we made, but I, I, want, I want to see this as a, as a bigger conversation around haptics applied to an industry, right? Now, we picked navigation for a very specific reason, because navigation is so inherently visual that like most people almost can't even imagine you know, navigating without having access to any visuals at all, right? The other part is, is that like when we looked at the market opportunities for navigation, they were massive. You know, there are 1 billion people that use Google Maps monthly not even navigation apps, you know, like, and between Google Maps and Waze, like, you know, which Google owns, they own about 65% of the market for, for, for maps, right? And so everyone is navigating around, you know, like, but navigation is such a visual experience that like most people don't even, when I tried to tell people that, hey, the challenges of visual-based navigation, people didn't even understand it as a problem. Right. You know, and so we see the opportunity, um, but also see that it's very limited. And what can we do about that inherent visualness? So the idea of tackling navigation was tackling the behemoth. You know, like if we can prove with navigation that we can do a purely haptic experience, then well, that opens up the opportunity, that opens up the marketplace, more opportunity, more it opens up the inspiration for the people who are coming after us still working in industry to see things that like, wow, wait, you can do that. I think I can do something in this space as well. And that's the big part of kind of what we want to drive home. Next slide. So why is visual-based navigation a problem, right? Well, oftentimes it's just not safe, right? You know, you're walking around and navigating, you know, like, but you also need your eyes to pay attention to what's going on around you. Right? And in some situations, in some conditions, you're traveling, you're walking by yourself, it's late at night, you just got to Paris or, you know, Bali or whatever place you've never been to before. And, you know, you're gonna stare down at your phone, take out all of your awareness, you know, blind yourself at night from the bright phone screen. And ultimately, you know, that's going to let someone know that you're in a vulnerable position potentially, right? And so, next slide, please. The other thing is, is that oftentimes it's not practical, right? You know, you have to driving a bike through New York City, as an example, looking at the screen, taking your eyes off the road. And now drivers, we drive around with maps all the time. No one thinks twice of it. But in the span of a few seconds, you can go you know, a few dozen feet, like, eyes completely off of the road, unseen of what happens. Um, and, and we don't see it as a problem, but because there's, there's no way to, to go around that problem at this moment, right? And so that's why it's acceptable, but that's why you can't text messages while you're driving also, right? So it's like the, 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 the awareness, and we already are working with organizations that are like, how do we get people to stop looking at screens while and, and take their eyes off of the road? Next, please. But the bigger conversation is for 285 million people worldwide, visual-based navigation is impossible. Or let's just say it's very, very challenging, right? You know, like now audio navigation does exist for the blind community, 
But if you're blind, think about it. Like your ears are your eyes. It's kind of how you listen to spatial awareness and information. And so if I'm headphones in, turn right at the next corner. You can no longer hear the car that has just pulled up near in front of you or the person that's walking up alongside of you, right? And these are things that you need to feel safe and to keep yourself safe. Um, super duper important, right? And so what we really see is an opportunity. Next slide, please. So what we really saw was an opportunity to create this new space of how do we access the sense of touch directly in navigation? So we did is we built the band called the Wayband. Um, I talked about it being a haptic navigation device. It pairs with our Wayband app. And now directly from a map, directly from your phone, you can download it, say type in where you wanna go and any address, and you'll get walking directions turn by turn and it will gently guide you through your whole journey you can look at the map, you can listen to the audio, but you don't need to. And it's a different way of navigating. It's kind of like going to a place that you've never been, but feeling like you've been there a thousand times before. Also, with that QR code, you can scan and download the Wayband app on iOS only at the moment right now. Um, totally on us. Um, we just made the app available completely for free. Um, and if you want, you can donate 99 cents to the development cause. We'd appreciate it. Now, next slide, please. So how do we do it? Because most people are like, well, do you have a device on your left wrist and a device on your right wrist? I mean, I do, but like not two way bands, right? Um, the way we do this is, is we built a 360 degree based experience. We call it haptic compass. Um, and Imagine it kind of like a regular compass. When you're facing the right way, you feel absolutely no vibration. When you swivel slightly to the left or to the right, you'll get a tiny vibration. And that vibration will get stronger the wrong way you turn into 180 degrees the wrong way, where we give you the loudest vibration we can. Essentially, it's a tactile game of hot and cold that's so intuitive that we put this band on 90% of people and they can figure out the right way to go within seconds. And most of them have never even heard of the word haptic before. Next slide, please. So what do we do? Right. And here's the and here's the here's the point, and, and it's very simple. We just took haptics and combined them with maps. Right. And we started to look at where are the opportunities in maps where the idea of vision as the main sensory modality doesn't serve the user so well. In 2016, I went to Austin, the South by Southwest. We were invited to present Super Fresh Startup. We were really excited, our first major event. We would pull people out of the crowd. And ultimately, at one point, we would have Everyone's been around, right? And I, I have this joke now that says, like, when we make people spin around, they become our friends because, you know, they will be super skeptical. I put the band on, I'd have them spin around, and by the end, I'm like, wow, this is crazy. Yeah, this is amazing, right? You know? And one of the people that we pulled out of the crowd um, happened to be a teacher for the Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. And so we end up going and trailing around to get there. And that was actually the story of how. We started working with the blind and visually impaired community. At first, we thought it was a use case that we would get to at the end, because when we first started, we didn't know that haptic navigation was actually possible. Um, a lot of people from this space come from deep research backgrounds. We come from design backgrounds. So I was just jumping in and we were figuring things out along the way and just running to kind of see what happened. Um, and so, you know, like, and then we were doing the test on the back end to see kind of like how effective those things were. So um, it was a lot of fun. And now um, we took this simple concept of haptics and maps, and we were able to do something that wasn't able to be done at all in history until that moment. So now when we think of like, when we take haptics and we take maps out and you fill it with anything else, what are the opportunities that now get created? 
right? And, you know, like I do a lot of hiking, for example. So like outside of the use case of blind and visually impaired, um, I do a lot of trail hiking. I love it. It's great. But, you know, oftentimes I'm looking at the map and like mm, almost twisting my ankle because I stepped over a rock, right? Or, you know, like if I'm not, if I don't have my map, then I'm walking off and maybe I miss a marker and I'm walking the wrong direction and I have to walk back, right? You're walking up the mountain, walking back is like hard work. So, you know, like when I wear my wave band, I just get vibrated through the course and I can just pay attention to the road, right? No sounds. Um, and more importantly, when I drop my hand down by my side, the wave band goes to silence. So it doesn't give me information if I don't want it. So the other pieces that we were able to look at, like how do we get people back into their real experience? Because the real goal of a map is not to be looking at the map. The real goal of a map is to look like you know where you're going so that you can enjoy the place that you're exploring, right? And that's a big part of it. Next slide, please. So we were able to get patents, um, which was fantastic on both our haptic compass, um, the way that we've developed for orientating, orienting people um, using our haptics. And also we built a unique mechanism uh, for isolations, um, we realized that you needed a lot of power to, to shake the entire wearable. And so we were looking at ways of delivering and isolating the haptic so that it delivers directly into the skin and not so much into the device. And so these are our two patents. Um, and we've been seeing some really amazing opportunities that I'll talk about later. Um, but ultimately, like these two pieces of framework allow us the space to play and topics that change with position and orientation in space. Next slide, please. So now, um, here's a product shot, but also, too, there's a story behind this as well that's super valuable. When we started in 2015, you know, when we first decided to start the company, um, you know, the Apple Watch wasn't in market yet. Um, you know, I think it dropped that fall. Um, and, you know, like, let alone the, you know, we were like, there were some Fitbits, um, you know, like, but for a large majority part, the, the wearable landscape space was, was, was pretty barren. And that's why we decided to make a wearable because we wanted to have control over the haptic experience because most people were just, they didn't care about the haptics. They just needed your phone to notify you, which is hi, 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 hey, it's one note. It doesn't need any nuance, so it doesn't really matter. They would a lot of early phones, especially, would just have the cheapest thing that would vibrate the phone, right? And you know, like, so you couldn't get consistent haptic experiences across multiple devices because you couldn't tell what haptic motors you were driving in. It was, you know, it's like it's kind of like working in like, you know, like graphic design without like color correction, color screen, you know, corrections. I did the software. So we were looking at it from a point of view of like, initially we built the Wayband and the app was a way to engage with the Wayband. But then all of a sudden the app became the thing that was the biggest driver. And now with other devices out, instead of, you know, making them uh, exclusive so that only our Wayband would work to try to lock people into our ecosystem, we expanded and said, hey, well, let's, let's see how we can haptically convert the experience for you know different wearables out on the market to give people the, the most access to the platform and i think access is a super duper important word um because in our world we're working with people who are blind and visually impaired we're looking at you know um statistics that are pretty staggering from an unemployment point of view and so it's like we had conversations with people that were like interoperability and the significance and how important that is. I think that, you know, this, 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 this drive of locking people into ecosystems by getting them tagged into to hardware. I, I think that the move that we need to make, especially as a, a, a growing haptics industry is to make more things more interoperable so that our things can work together. And ultimately that builds the, a pie that's bigger so that we can all play in. Next slide, please. So, Haptic Nav, um, the app. Um, so, 
we got a resounding amount of people when, when we got hit with the cost piece was like, Hey, you know, we had someone reached out to me and say, Hey, I get $700 a month on SSI. I can't afford your way. And then we started thinking about it. it was like, ah, oh, well, what if we could make the phone vibrate? Where you, you know, you can't make the phone vibrate. Like, but what if we just turn the phone into the way band and you can just hold it in your hand? And so now we built it in so that like, you don't even need to have a way band. You can just hold the phone as the only experience and point the phone in which direction and it acts as the magic pointer. It's actually a really, really cool way to get around town. Um, no hardware involved um, and more accessibility for people who are blind or visually impaired. Ultimately, if they want a hands-free experience, the Wayband is there. And now we tag into their Apple Watch and coming soon to uh, Android Wear um, by the end of this year. Next slide, please. So some of the market dynamics, right? And we're, we're talking about, you know, the blind and visually impaired, because this was the market that we specifically researched while we were doing our work. But we dug into some adjacent markets and, you know, the, the numbers there, you know, like represent some really astounding potential from a point of view of like innovative product development and markets that also oftentimes, you know, solution and design starved um or have solutions that are outdated and very costly in the space right you know and so there are 21 million people in the united states with a visual impairment that's uh, legal blindness considered 20 over 200 that means basically that what you can see at 200 feet a person who at 20 over 200 needs to be at 20 feet to see right um and you know that's the definition of legal blindness or i believe uh and it's Please, I'm sure the experts in here can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe there's like a cone of vision of about 15 degrees or less. So you see perfectly in a cone of field of 15 degrees, or if you have 20 over 200 or worse vision, you're considered blind. Now, you know, blindness is very much a spectrum. And this is a super important part, like all disability, like, you know, all ability, let's say, um, is a spectrum. And, you know, there are some people who see total nothing, right? But that's a very small population of the blind and visually impaired community. Most people with blind and visual impaired have some access to maybe light or dark detection, maybe central versus peripheral vision. And we've had some people talk about that earlier in the conversations, which has been great. I feel like it's been like such a synergetic um, uh, a conference, watching everyone um, drop these hints that, that lead in to the bigger conversation that we're talking about, which is like, how do we get um, more innovative products and more access um, potential out of, you know, like the human body, essentially. Um, so um, the other thing is, is that like you look at the global statistics now, you're looking at 285 million people. Like this is not a small number. But you also look at the fact that like in developing countries, especially in the United States, like age related macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy are the two leading causes of blindness. Right. And one of three people over the age of 62 is infected with some sort of visual impairment, right? So this is like a one out of three of us in the room here is going to be impacted by these conditions. So like when we think about ability and, and, and the disability market, like, like, you know, like, a, you know, there's a joke within the community that's kind of like, Oh, the disability minority is the only one that you can join at any time. Right. Um, you know, like it's, it's, it's really important for us to think of ability as a temporary phenomenon and to ultimately recognize that these solutions that we're building that is quote unquote for accessibility is going to be at some point for ourselves when we need them and we're in those accessible spaces. Right. And, 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 and that's just, you know, that's what makes it really, really great design overall. Now, jumping in really quickly. The hearing impaired community globally is 466 million, right? You know, like you're also looking at, you know, like we were looking at these different populations. We were looking at hiking, cycling, running, biking, you know, and the elderly community. So these were numbers for the United States in specific. But, you know, I just want to say that there's some big numbers here and there's some big opportunities here. And that's the big part to understand is that innovation in this space is not necessarily you know not for profit it's it's very value driven it's it's by a customer that has a very strong need and pain point and it's also an opportunity to like really dramatically you know like like change you know like someone's capability for living independently and i think 
ultimately like we'll need that for ourselves at some point. Next slide, please. So people saying, you know, um, these were a few quotes that we took. Um, and, you know, also too, really quickly, I love this, this sketch, right? But, uh, you know, this, uh, this haptic corridor, as, it, as, as we used to call it, um, we didn't call it that. That's what people called it. And this, this drawing was actually done by Discovery, but that's not how it actually works. Um, so, you know, like, we totally have um, uh, the compass based thing, but this visual is such a great way of showing how it all comes together, right? All right, next slide, please. So, what is this really all about, right? You know, like for me, what this is really all about is creating a more inclusive digital world. At the moment, digital just means audio and visual. And we're at a space right now where, you know, like that excludes a quarter of a billion people. Now, we're moving toward a new digital. And ultimately, we see sight and sound each as lanes into the digital universe. And now what we're trying to do is we're trying to lay the third lane down. We're trying to lay down touch. And we're starting with these very utilitarian applications. But like we saw with some of the brainwave generated artwork, like when Picasso was painting, I don't think he was thinking about how his painting smelled or tasted. Haptics constantly have to think about the audio visual component. And so what happens when we step into that world where haptics are set free to be able to imagine purely from a haptic point of view without the need to tag into an audiovisual representative? One step at a time. Next slide, please. So WearWorks is a haptic platform company, um, and we essentially are exploring these questions in a deep way to understand the ZTR coding, and if you missed it for that, um, we're really exploring in a deep way how do we go about um, building products for the sense of touch? Right? And, and, and there are lots of things to consider. Next slide, please. So one, I, I, wanna, I wanna give a shout out, special thanks to some of our investors and some of the grants that we won. And also too, I wanna show that there are people funding the space that we're in. You know, like reach out to some of these partners. Um, you know, like they're happy to engage. They've already engaged with their dollars and us. So, you know, like reach out to them. There's support there to kind of like push some of these narratives forward if you're interested in kind of doing more work in these particular spaces. Next, please. Now, the journey begins with education, right? So I have a few minutes left. Um, really quickly, I want to go through and, and say that at this point right now, um, I don't have a degree in haptics. Again, you know, like most people who have a degree in haptics have a PhD in human computer interaction. Um, I've seen some master levels programs, but what I haven't seen is really any undergraduate programs. Now, I learned the word haptic when I was 33, but I learned the word engineer when I was 12. Guess what that gave me the ability to do? It gave me the ability to graduate as an engineer at 24 and it gave engineering industry a pipeline to talent. The haptics industry right now is $9.2 billion it did in 2022. It was projected to do 8 billion three years ago in 2022. Right now we're projected to do um, 23 billion by 2030. It's triple X, but we don't have triple X the manpower right now to man these haptic operations, to do the haptic research, to answer these questions that we haven't had the time that we've had with sight and sound to answer, right? You know, we all know that middle C sounds great to everybody, right? Like why? Because we did the research. At some point, someone did it. And now like touch is in that space as well. And we need to fund research and we need to get people excited about doing it. And now I'm trying to push forward um, means of education. Next slide, please. Making an impact. Um, so here's some of the things that we're building on the side as well. Um, we're building an HDK for our A band and an SDK for our haptic compass. The goal around this is like, how do we allow people to easily ex access ability to, to, uh, to add haptics to their existing applications and play with them, or to if they have more technical ability to like output haptics directly to their device. Because guess what? If you have music creation software and you don't have speakers, you don't have music. Right? And so now Wayband becomes the, 
you know, the happy version of AirPod. Now we have the ability for people to make haptic music through, you know, like different software that are available in the market at the moment. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that like I'm really excited about, and this is a deep kind of like contemplation of mine for me is uh, I've, I've been accepted as a, the Leonard Pryor um, Fellowship recipient at Kansas City Art Institute. And a big part of this is like, how do we bring the the conversation to non-technical um, audiences, to audiences of artists, to audiences of fashion designers, to creators? Right. And ultimately, like my goal is, is how do we build a framework for undergraduate haptic education? Graphic design, I can study for four years. Right. You know, like, um, but if my haptic researcher, you know, needs as much education as a general practitioner doctor, I um, think it's really expensive for haptic research. And, you know, but meanwhile, a UI UX researcher can go through a program, you know, at General Assembly in about 12 months to get to a point of like competency. Right. How do we do that for haptics so that we can like, you know, like decrease the cost of some of the research that we have to do to, to prove out some of these points? And I think that that can be a big driving point. How do we build the talent, the talent pipeline so that when this haptic industry is, you know, what it's going to be in 2030, that there's sufficient people to, to, to fill those gaps. Next slide, please. So the medium is the message. Oh my goodness, someone said that. I think, I think that was Noah who said it earlier today. Um, um, tagged into, you know, the idea is, is that like, you know, a big part of education and a big part of the haptic conversation is that it's tied up a lot in like scientific papers, right? But, you know, looking at like, you know, the multimedia ecosystem is what I'm looking to explore now. Like, how do you have conversations that are more traditional for people, you know, talk the idea of education and entertainment, right? And, and coming that together. And so I'm not sure if we'll, can we get the next slide, please? So music is a medium. I'm not sure if this is actually going to work. I think we just got wind now. Uh, the video may not play, but if it doesn't play, don't worry. I'll do it um, for you acapella. Um, but um, uh, a project came up, you know, like now um, I've been freestyle rapping for a good part of my life, just to myself, not never anything professional. I decided I should write a rap and record it so I could say that I did that and check that box off realized songwriting was actually very challenging um, and decided that like if I was going to spend all this time writing a song, it should be about something that was super important to me. So I wrote a rap about haptics um, and the goal is, is to kind of get people to understand what it is, to take it out of the scientific context, um, but to speak to it accurately and to inspire, you know, possibilities. So can I get the next one, please? Oh, really quickly, uh, side note. Um, so this is Mark Keith Price, two-time Paralympian. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. I met him. Um, we donated some way bands to his charity. Um, he's doing a lot of things. Um, but one of the things that he also happened to do is I, I, I ran the rap past him because I wanted to make sure the references I had uh, for people who are blind, you know, weren't offensive. And he said, that is super cool. And also I make music. And I was like, wow, we should work together on this. So the beat was actually made by Marquis Price. I, my joke to him was, I was like, man, you know, we can have a two-time Paralympian produce a track and Chief Hapik offers a rap. Like, we can go viral even if the song is garbage, right? And so let's see how garbage we got. Now, uh, um, how are we looking here? Are we able to get this video to play? If not... Not good. Okay, perfect. Here we go. I'm just going to do this acapella, okay? Um, so we made this song. I originally wanted to call the song Raptics, right? You know, you had an art of haptics. Um, but, you know, my friend had a better name for it called Haptics. We have a vision. It starts off with We have a vision. We have a vision. We have a vision. We have a vision. We have a vision of a world that doesn't need vision. Elevate and touch to the level of sight and sound. And that's our mission. Research spending. Today is access tomorrow for all of our children. Look at the spending over the last hundred years spread over each of the five of our senses. Seeing is believing. Most went to vision. Something with the sound, which is pretty far distant. For a hundred years, money only spent on two senses. Isn't that senseless? That shit is senseless. Here's my two cents and visions king and touches in prison. Patriarch of all the senses of sight. 
Who would have made that decision? Who would have made that decision? No one with limited vision, none of the 285 million, and was a hearing 460 million folk with limited hearing, digital, so sight and sound driven that it left like a billion on the wrong side of a digital divide with virtually no pot to piss in. The future is touched, that's our mission. Where works is haptic, such with the weight and intention, dramatically making a difference. You need to listen. We have a vision. We have a vision. We have a vision. We have a vision. We have a vision of a world that doesn't need vision. We have a vision of a world that doesn't need vision. Haptic so open-ended. It's like a new beginning. Man, no rules are written. It's like you can do anything if you just have a vision. Pun intended. So little prior knowledge, so few restrictions. So much to learn, it's like my new addiction, adding a new dimension to the human existence. Touch the new kids on the block, call us new addition. It might seem a bit distant, but in 10 years, every device built will have haptics built in it. This is my mission. I am a haptician, a tactician of touch. Bruce Lee's one inch punch, one tap, and you'll feel the difference. The standing for nine years in haptics, grinding relentless, made history, helping the blind run of finish. The New York Marathon without sighted assistance. We touched down on a touchdown. Now bear witness. We have a vision. We have a vision. We have a vision. We have a vision. We have a vision of a world that doesn't need vision. We have a vision of a world that doesn't need vision. How'd you get in this? Saw real life in fiction. Saw the matrix a thousand times. Saw my future envisioned. Building a suit to download and learn Kung Fu. That was my entrance. Then we made it a business. Subtracted complexity, then added in making a difference. The recipe to build an industry that will be valued in trillions. Tribe, I'm trying to find my eldest but told that it's a village. My haptic signals in the sky. Come and find me if you feel it. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, I have another slide. Oh, sorry, wait. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you. So um, on that note, oh, I've got it. Comments and questions, I found them. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna read this question out loud. Um, my daughter is deaf and used a tactile device bus to help her with her surroundings. When you said touch the language, I'm curious if you thought about using touch to actually help train uh, uh, SPE, oh, speech, got it. Yes, I have been very excited about that opportunity. Um, so now this is, this is completely off of a thought experiment. Nothing that we've done from a point of view of, 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 of company wise. Um, we've been really focused in, 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 in the mode of navigation. Um, so that's why my position at Kansas City is going to give me a bit more opportunity to dig into a lot of these things. But ultimately, one of the things that we're looking to explore is, is like, how do we tag in um, haptic cues, um, the syllabary um, for language learning? Um, I'm learning Swedish on Duolingo. The Swedish and English pronunciation is slightly different. Um, and, you know, just understanding the number of beats in a word. Um, personally, it would give me understanding that, oh, this is the pronunciation of this word. Na, 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 how I would say it from an English point of view with an English tonality. And so we were actually looking to partner with um, uh, uh, people in the linguistic space, I mean, in the speech space, to see if we could put together some research around that. So um, would love to have more conversations um uh human brain matters um please let's let's uh chat with me uh, offline keith at where dot works does anybody else have any questions
Yes, I'm happy to share the PowerPoint. Um, and also, so yeah, the, the 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 videos will be there. So the, the video that was going to play was is uh, it had the words on it, so you can follow along, and it had the beat with the hook, and I was going to rap over top of it live. Um, but actually, um, I'm 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 doing the uh, I'm working with the team. So South by Southwest ultimately um, became an investor of ours. Um, and now um, we performed it and debuted this song at South by um, to 2000 people. It went pretty amazingly well. And now we're actually doing a, a recording of it at Billboard Studios uh, next week. So uh, um, hopefully I'll, be, I'll have like the final, final version um, released and can share it with the community um, when it's ready to roll. But yeah, the links and the video, we can have them. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was so a so beautiful comment. I'm sorry. Um, was there? A, was there it says there was one more question, but I don't see it anywhere. Oh, got it. Okay, cool, perfect. Oh, that was so beautiful. Okay. Um, um, I, 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 what other applications for haptics? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, so the, the big things are is like, you know, like if, if you look at what's in the space right now, um, you know, the gaming industry, as we, you know, it, that was just a surprise to me. I turned around and somehow games is three times larger than film and music combined. And I'm like, thought I was in a counterculture. Um, um, the gaming industry's explosive growth has been a big proponent of it. You know, um, you know, the, 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 the PlayStation 5, the Nintendo Switch, right? You know, video game haptics, the, going back to the Rumble Pack uh, from Nintendo Switch has always been, you know, like, you know, gaming is, is, is where a lot of the innovation starts, you know, like it was said earlier. So um, that's been a lot of the space for haptics. Um, the other major space that's been um, kind of like pushing things forward is the, is the medical community. Um, uh, Telerobotic and telesurgeries in particular has been, you know, how do you get force feedback, but also to like highly trained surgeons, you know, if they could be all over the world and didn't need to necessarily like locate there to do the surgeries, then all of a sudden you have more people to have access to potentially lower cost surgeries, right? So um, I know the team at DaVinci has been doing some really remarkable work um, in the haptic space over there. Um, their tools from, from the point of view of a looking at like you know um I, I can't remember what it's called right now but it's a it's a pen tool that allows you to sculpt 3d in space with haptic feedback um you have you have haptic x with you know their big super haptic suit right and kind of like big gloves now they're trying to reproduce haptics and like with air pressure um to a almost like reality based level right and you know the backpack, I don't even know how much it costs, but it, I'm, I'm sure it, it has multiple zeros um, behind it. Um, and then you also, you have things like the Tesla suit um, and, you know, be haptics that are doing things with gloves and haptic suits, peripherals, Booger. It's another company that's done some amazing things. Um, from an accessibility point of view, you have Sue Ben, it's in the space. They've been doing their thing for quite a long time. They're an ultrasonic distance detector um, for people who are blind and visually impaired. We do navigation, they do obstacle detection, slightly different, but a lot of synergies. Um, so ultimately, you know, like right now, like the, the, that's what's been happening in the haptic space. I think that going forward, what we're going to see, um, and this is really interesting, is, is that I think that um, tagging in, because there's so much information that's communicated through visual means, because we just decided that visual was just the way to go for most information, but because we have the technology that is communicating visual stuff super easy, like screens and lights. So like, I'm, I think that the biggest opportunity is, is that like, what happens when you can just reduce that cognitive load? And what does it look like to start feeling like when you can like drive from a sense of like in your car, you get a sense of like the cars around you based off of like seat positioning, right? And you're like, oh, I can feel that there's a car behind me. I can feel that there's a car kind of over my shoulder. You know, like all of a sudden it extends the possibility of the human body to the, you know, the robotic realm, you know, and, and so like now you can feel your car, you can feel your way through, you, you extend your own sense of self, 
Um, in the same way, like if you wear a top hat, at some point your body will start to adjust for the fact that you have a hat on and you will include the hat as part of your body. It's just, it's just the way that it works, right? And so um, really excited about some of those opportunities, but I think the, 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 the biggest things that I see on the forefront and, you know, as the necessary component is, is that if you want to like learn Python, you can learn Python with like a book and like, you know, a computer at 13 or 10, right? You know, like if you want to learn how to do physical computing, grab an Arduino, right? You know, like if, if, if you want to do music production, garage band, you know, logic, whatever, right? You can, there's so many things that like graphics software, Adobe, right? Figma can't, if you want to, if you want to jump into haptics, you want to jump into touch, there's no way. It's, it's, it's like, you got to know hardware, which is hard. You got to know the software, you can understand the sense of touch. And like, it's a lot of pieces to put together. And I think ultimately the big opportunity that we have is like, how do we build the ecosystem out in a way that puts these tools there so that the community can create things. And if you think about like the app ecosystem, there are millions of apps that Apple probably never even imagined, you know, like, and that's the point is, is that like, you know, we can be gatekeepers of the haptic world, right. Or we can open up the gates and co-create that haptic world. Um, because at the end of the day, we're all just figuring it out. And, and some of us know more than others, of course, but like, how do we get that information at mass and at scale and in language and in forms that is accessible so that like a 10 year old can be like, I want to do haptics. That's what we need. And right now that doesn't exist. Thank you so much. This has been fantastic. I um, really enjoy being here and please, if you want to stay in touch, you can find me on uh, my link tree that was posted, uh, link tree of Keithius. K-E-I-T-H-I-U-S. And you can look at our website at www.word.works. Cheers.